My experiences over the past 10 years have taught me one simple truth. The future of business is going to be data-driven. Now, if you believe that, if you're thinking to yourself, oh, duh, Dave, that's, that's super profound. Thanks for telling me something I already know. Cool. What I'm about ready to say then shouldn't be that controversial or maybe not controversial at all. In the future, every professional is going to be a data analyst. Now, just to be crystal clear, what I'm not asserting is that there will be one job title to rule them all and every professional will be called a data analyst. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm offering, what I'm asserting is that in the future, every role, okay, maybe not every role, but the vast majority of roles in organizations are going to have an expectation of a baseline level of data analysis skills. Just like the vast majority of roles in organizations in the modern economy have an expectation that you have basic skills with Microsoft Office. They kind of expect that you can work with Word documents and PowerPoint presentations and Excel spreadsheets. They just kind of make that assumption. In a similar fashion, you're going to see a baseline level of data analysis just to be an expectation for any type of professional. I believe I have a bit of unique perspective on this, which gives me a little bit of credibility, and I hope you will agree. So not only have I been a hands-on analytics professional for more than 10 years, supporting all aspects of the business, finance, customer service, marketing, product management, IT, you name it. I've also been a hands-on professional in the customer service space. I have been a hands-on professional in the IT space. I've been a hands-on professional in product management when I worked at Microsoft in the SQL Server team. So I've also got some actual business experience as well as the hands-on analytic experience. And what I can tell you is this, so many of the analyses that I have done over the years for professionals from different parts of the business can and should be done by those professionals. They shouldn't bottleneck through me as the analytics professional or the data teams that I have led in previous roles. And here's the secret. You get so much power as a professional using a relatively small number of simple data analysis techniques. And what I'm gonna show you in this video is an example of that from three business domains, marketing, product management, customer service. I will also have other examples that you can download in a PDF, and I'll talk about that later. And I'm gonna walk you through these in PowerPoint. I'm gonna show you that with these very simple techniques, which any professional can learn how to do, you can up your game in terms of the value that you bring to your employer. So let's go ahead and flip over to PowerPoint, and let me show you what I mean. All right, here I am in the PowerPoint for this particular video. And by the way, if you're interested, you can get a PDF version of these slides from a link down below the video in the description. And there's also additional um, areas of the business like HR, for example, that I won't be covering in the video. So you can check that out if you're interested. So let's talk about marketing first and foremost. So marketing, in my experience, is one of those areas of the business, and digital marketing in particular, by the way, that is ripe for professionals with data analysis skills to offer disproportionate value to be more competitive as high quality employees in the space. And that's because marketing these days, and especially digital marketing, is very, very data driven. And I'm gonna go over three relatively simple data analysis techniques that any professional can learn how to do. And by the way, that's not made up. I have taught hundreds of working professionals these skills, so I know what I'm talking about. So anybody can learn how to do this, and you can up your game, you can, be a more effective marketer, especially in digital marketing, by having these skills. And I'm gonna give you some hypothetical examples here. Well, actually, technically they're not, <laughs> they're not really hypothetical because they're based on my hands-on work in analytics. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the first technique. And the first technique is known as a process behavior chart. If you're familiar at all with my content, you know I love these charts. I evangelize them, I teach people how to use them, and they are simply awesome in a very, very simple way to understand these things. They are basically a line chart. So they allow you to track a measurement, a metric, a KPI, an OKR, some sort of number that measures what's going on in the business over time. And it allows you to conduct sophisticated data analyses using these simple charts. And you can build them in Excel. And I'd imagine you could build them in Google Sheets as well. I've never done it because I'm an Excel user, but it wouldn't surprise me if you could. So you can use a spreadsheet software like Excel to build these charts, or you can use our programming. Don't panic. Our programming is wildly easy for any professional to learn, and I'll talk more about that later. So with these process behavior charts, check out what you can do as a marketer. So let's say that you have a website and you're tracking the usage in Google Analytics, let's say, 
and you decide, your company decides to make a site-wide change. They change the color scheme, the branding, the theme, I don't know, something like that. It'd be interesting to know, for example, hey, did our traffic actually change? So for example, maybe you're looking not just at inbound traffic, but maybe you're looking at dwell time or the number of pages that people look at or how long people spend on the page, that sort of thing. You can do that kind of analysis. And notice I use the word actual here because what I'm talking about here is a statistical analysis that says, look, after we made the change to the website theme in a statistically significant way, we've seen things improve. And it doesn't require any fancy math. You don't have to go back to school and learn stats or anything like that. These charts make it wildly, wildly easy to do analyses like these. Additionally, let's say you're in the digital marketing space and you change the ad copy. So you have an ad on Facebook, let's say, that had a certain amount of ad copy, a certain number of words on it. And then you say, look, this thing isn't working real well. Let's change the ads. And let's say for whatever reason, you decide not to run an A-B test. And if you don't know what an A-B test is, don't worry about it. If you do, you know what I'm talking about. Because sometimes this happens. It happens where folks should run A-B tests. They want to test ad copy, but they don't. They get super excited. They think this ad copy is awesome. And they just change things wholesale. So this allows you to actually take a look at the data of the previous ad copy compared to the old ad copy, the previous ad copy and the new ad copy, excuse me. <laughs> and then do a statistical analysis, which is exactly what you do an A-B test for anyway, by the way. And you don't need one in this particular case. So these things are awesome. They are super, super useful for marketers in general. So next step is linear regression analysis. And don't panic, don't panic. You can use linear regression analysis effectively as a professional without knowing all of the underlying complexities of how linear regression works. You use a tool like Excel or R and it actually handles all the mathematics for you. So you focus on learning how to use linear regression effectively, evaluate that your models are legitimate, and then present the results. So you focus on the concepts, not on the math. So here's some examples of what you can do using linear regression. Are there synergies, which are known as interaction effects, between digital ad channels? And this is based on, all of these, by the way, are based on real life marketing analyses that I've done as a hands-on analytics professional. So in this particular scenario, what you're interested in is this idea that, for example, if I run Facebook ads in a city and I run Google search ads in a city and maybe display ads as well at the same time, that those two things interoperate. They are like chocolate and peanut butter. They are better together. So we get more sales, we get more traffic, we get more clicks, whatever it is when we run both of these things at the same time. You can use linear regression analysis to actually use the data and say, is this actually true, yes or no? It's super easy, way more easy than you might think. And the next up, for example, in marketing, one of the things that you care about is customer lifetime value. If we acquire a customer somehow, how much money are they gonna spend with us over their lifetime? Because if we spend more money to get the customer than they give us, then we're losing money with every customer. And I have seen that in, in the real world, by the way, just so you know, that is not made up. <laughs> but you can lose, use linear regression for that kind of analysis as well. And then lastly, and maybe the most hype filled of the scenarios here, you can use machine learning. And there is a particular machine learning technique known as the random forest algorithm, which is a very powerful but very simple, very easy to learn and apply machine learning technique. I've taught hundreds of people how to use this particular technique, and you can totally do it. Once again, you're gonna need something like R, that's by far the easiest way to get to this type of data analysis. And once again, anybody can learn how to do R, and I'll talk about that more later. But let's see what you can do with the Mighty Random Forest machine learning technique in the marketing space. So for example, what are the customer journey factors that predict conversion? So if you have the data, whether you pull it from your Google Analytics, whether you pull it from your database or from your, lo your event log files, from your web servers, whatever it might be, right? There's a whole bunch of data that gets collected regarding the customer journey through your website, through your sales process, whatever it might be. And you can use that data and then analyze it using machine learning and say, look, which are the factors, which of all these different things that can happen in the customer journey are actually the most important in predicting paid conversion. It's super awesome to know as a marketer. Next up, this one's one of my favorites because I've, I've done this before and it's very, very powerful, which is you can grab free data, for example, in the United States from the US Census Bureau, marry that up with your customer data and say, look, which demographic factors are most indicative of conversion? So you can say, hey, out of all the people 
with these types of characteristics, which ones are the best ones for us to target with our marketing efforts? Super, super powerful. Awesome stuff. It's this marketing is like one of my favorite areas for applying data analysis, if you can't tell. And you can see this just six reasons why I write here. And there are many, many more. Next up, let's take a look at product management. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, I was a product manager. I was a PM in the SQL Server team at Microsoft for a couple of years. So not only have I done analytics work in support of product management, I've been a product manager myself. If you're a product manager in any shape or form, data analysis skills is going to be a key differentiator for you to have more impact in your work as a PM. And once again, I'm gonna use the same three data analysis techniques. I'm gonna go through these a little more rapidly now, and you can see the kinds of things that you can do. First up, process behavior charts. Did recent feature enhancements actually increase feature usage. PMs often create and manage and shepherd the creation of new features. It'd be nice to know if they actually were used. Pretty rudimentary thing, I would imagine. <laughs> Here's another thing, right? This is something that was near and dear to my heart as a PM. The engineering team, the coders, they said, hey, look, you know, we're going to change our process because it's going to make us more effective. We're going to write less bugs. We're going to create less defects. You can use the process behavior chart to analyze that because you say, look, at this particular point in time, we switched over to the new engineering process. Did the defect rate, in fact, actually go down in a statistically significant way? It's pretty cool. So next up, linear regression. So what are the important factors that predict customer tenure for my product? So for example, if you are a PM in a software as a service or a SaaS space, not only do you care about paid conversion based on your features, of course, as a PM, you're also interested in seeing how long these people are. A very common term that is used is stickiness. How sticky is the customer? How often are they paying that monthly subscription fee? And what actually predicts that? It's a very interesting thing to know. Once again, CLV, PMs are very interested in CLV because it costs money to develop features. It costs money to develop products. So you wanna make sure that you are actually getting more than the money back that you spent to build the product in the first place. And then lastly, once again, the mighty random forest, the application of machine learning, predictive models, to the PM space. So what factors are highly predictive of churn? I've had many, many PMs over the past few years ask me this. They are highly concerned with churn. But for no other reason, because simply because there might be a hole in the feature set of the product. And that's why people are churning. They sign up, let's say for a SaaS product, and they come in there and they say, oh, you don't actually have feature X, Y, Z. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna pay you anymore because you won't do what I need. PMs are often interested in churn. And of course, sticky customers, once again, very, very powerful. Now you might notice that there's a little bit of some overlap here between linear regression and the mighty random forest because they're both predictive models. However, they have different aspects, which I won't go into today, just notice that one often is better than the other, depending on what kind of question you're interested in answering. Data analysis PMs, awesome. Lastly, for this video, we're gonna talk about customer service. And I haven't been a customer service manager, but my very first professional job out of university many, many years ago, I worked in a customer service call center at a bank, so I do have some experience in this space. So first up, process behavior charts. Has there actually, has there been a statistically significant change in the call volumes sufficient that the manager should actually go ask for more headcount? Think about how awesome this is. If you can use your data and rigorously analyze it in a standardized way and come up to your boss, you know, maybe the director of customer service, I don't know, and say, the data clearly shows that our call volumes have changed, they've shifted up, it looks permanent, I need more staff on the floor to handle the customer service calls. Otherwise, our quality of service is gonna go down. What do you wanna do? Awesome. Another thing that you can take a look at is, let's say you have multiple shifts. Let's say you have a first shift, a swing shift, or a second shift, and a graveyard shift. You can look at the data and say, hey, is the second shift truly more efficient at handling calls? That's another type of analysis you can do. And if the answer is yes, you might then say, why is that? It's powerful stuff. Next up, linear regression. What are the critical factors that affect staffing levels. So you can use linear regression to investigate like call volumes, day of the week, hour of the day, uh, nature of the call, that sort of thing. Very, very powerful stuff. Also, you could then use linear regression to explore a question of, well, hey, based on what we just saw in the previous question, could we actually handle more calls with a different mix of agents? More tier two versus tier one, you know, that sort of thing. 
And then lastly, of course, once again, machine learning. Using the Mighty Random Forest, you can ask even more interesting questions, things like, what are the factors related to churn that customer service can address? Because sometimes, oftentimes actually, customers that churn end up calling customer service, contacting customer service multiple times. That's often a leading indicator that someone is about to churn is when they start talking to customer service. So that's a very powerful thing to know. And then this last thing here, if you're not familiar, is CSAT stands for customer satisfaction. And you can say, hey, what are the factors under customer services control that are highly associated, that are highly predictive of CSAT? And then the manager can then initiate programs, business experiments, to see if they can positively affect CSAT. As I've stated multiple times in this video, all of the data analysis techniques that I've discussed are eminently accessible to any professional, regardless of role or background. But I don't expect you to believe me. So what I'll do is I'll put up a couple of videos here and here on my channel, check them out. They will show you how easy it is for you to learn process behavior charts, or machine learning with R, if that's what you would like to do. So if you found this video useful, if you wouldn't mind helping me out with the YouTube algorithm, just go ahead and give me a like. That would be really, really cool. I would appreciate it. Every professional will be a data analyst in the future. Until next time, please stay healthy, and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.